Let's look at the first coral. The first guy that we have here is a marbled Favites, and it is twenty-five dollars. So Matthew here is in charge of lighting, and he's going to uh, shift the lighting over to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like under actinic. And back. So the bulbs that we're using right now are, um, it's a combination of two ATI bulbs. We're using um, Blue Plus and Aqua Blue Special. So it's not quite as daylight as some of the past live sales that we've done, but it kind of gives you a little bit more of a feel of um, what you might see in a typical home aquarium. And when we remove it, uh, the light that's shining in is some of the some of the LED, which tends to look more actinic anyway on camera. So that'll kind of give you a little bit of a, of a gradient as far as what you can expect spectrum-wise. So uh, every single coral will be shifting lights to give you an idea. All right, moving to the next coral, we have an Acropora. It's a blue tenius. And let me activate a thing here. This guy's $10. Okay, so let's move the lights again. Okay. I need to move my windows around just a little bit so I can read chat. Okay. Moving on. Next coral here is the pink bikini paleotholas, and they are 15. One sec. Okay, next coral up is actually a combination of zoanthids. Actually, no, it's not. I lied. It's the mellow yellow zoas, and these guys are $15. Okay, moving on. Now this is our combo zoanth, it's here. And they are $15. So on chat, do you guys see the video okay? Okay, just checking, because on mine it's just a refreshing thing here, so I can't see it. Let's try this again. Ah, much better. Okay, moving on. Next coral here is the yellow leptos leptastria. I was almost going to say leptoceras, but it's a leptastria. This guy's 25. Next coral is the green Pasilopora. Next guy up. is a mummy eye favia. 
So last time we did this, a lot of people were asking for a video on the difference between Favites and Favia, and we've been collecting some footage towards that video. However, I honestly have to do a lot more reading on the actual difference because there's several different similar species, like Goniastria, things like that, and the only way to really tell these guys apart is to look at their skeleton under microscope. And I've never been huge on, on taxonomy to begin with, so it's never, I guess, super comfortable with, um, with giving any kind of definitive information on what these things actually are. So uh, a little side story. Right now, the, the girls in Japan that are working on zoanthid identification, um, they're doing some taxonomy stuff. And... Um, the, the lengths that they have to go through to try to identify a particular zoa or pali is absolutely insane. So they're right now looking at certain texts and, and, uh, and reference materials that are from the 1800s that are written in German or Latin or some source country and like it's really really difficult. Like the descriptions that they have to go through are extremely general and that is literally the official description of a particular species. So I'm definitely not into all that. That's certainly not my cup of tea. But I will see what I can do. Because um, I think that a, a Favia Favites video would be interesting, but it might be a little bit lighter on the taxonomy end of things. Okay. Next guy up, coral number nine, is... Um, a green speckled mushroom. This guy's ten dollars. Next up is kind of a a cousin to it. It's the purple Rhodactus for 15. Kind of showing you the different the different lighting schemes here. Coral number 11 is a neon green nephthia for 25. I'll show you that in a sec. Need to move the camera. Hold on. He's a little taller than the frame. It's about almost two inches, I would say. These are fairly fast growers. Once they get settled in, I mean, it could grow into a 12 inch colony in no time at all. And they're one of the most fluorescent green corals out there, if you're looking for something that's very bright in the soft coral family. So, let's see. Next coral up is a green cabbage leather. I'm kind of surprised to find out that this is actually a Cinularia. Typically when I think of a Cinularia, I'm thinking of a branching leather, kind of similar to the Nephthia though we just saw. But um, nope, it turns out that cabbage leathers are a different, just a different species of, of Cinularia. Moving on, number 13 is a marbled Favites. Change the camera positioning again.
Okay, next coral is number 14, the yellow Leptastria. I need to pay closer attention to chat. I've just kind of been in, in my own little world here. Okay, next guy up is the purple bonsai acropora. It took a while for Acropora to color up, but these guys are finally starting to take on some decent coloration. I've mentioned it in many videos, but a lot of different types of corals kind of struggle during the, the summertime. And it's only until winter that they regain their coloration. And most of the SPS, especially Acropora, fall into this category. All right, I need to do a big shift here, so I'm going to cap the camera lens. This guy's our orange Tabastria, $15. Tabastria are a non-photosynthetic coral, so whoever ends up with this pretty much has to stick to a, an aggressive feeding schedule. Um, these guys do eat. They uh, extend mostly at night, but for the best results I've seen, um, people train them to come out at a certain time every day. and. It's really great because they have a really bright yellow polyp that extends and it can take up maybe three times their original size when it's fully extended. So um, I think it's worth it to, to, to try them if you're going to feed them at least twice a day uh, because that way they can really grow and extend and they start adding new polyps when they're fed regularly. Next up is a Magenta Recordia Yuma. I don't know if you guys have equal success with Yumas versus Recordia Florida, but we tend to find that the Yumas tend to be a little bit more sensitive than the Florida. And, um, some of the, the more exotic colors, like the bright yellow ones, the bright red ones, tend to do very, very poorly for us. But some of the, the greens and the purples like this tend to do really well. So that was number 17, Magenta Recordia Yuma for 25. The next guy up here, number 18, is a yellow scroll, and he is $20. These scroll corals are kind of interesting. When they're hit with a lot of light, they tend to be, tend to be um, almost a uniform yellow color. Under kind of muted lighting conditions like we have here, they start to have a, a purple base with a yellow polyp. And over time they get a, a like a, a bowl type shape. OK, 
Okay, next up is a bird of paradise. This is a Seriatopora, if you didn't already know. Very fast growing SPS. Actually, let me show you its tips here while Matthew moves the lights. Can you guys actually see a difference in the lighting when we do that? Because on, on my on my screen, I have a very very small screen on the camera. It's um, it's hard to tell because there's, I've got all these other effects going on to help me uh, do focus and stuff. So it's it it all looks like red outlines to me. Okay, item number twenty is a kryptonite candy cane. Another fast growing LPS. This guy's twenty dollars, I believe. And so every um, now and again through our broadcast, we like to do some trivia questions. And so the first trivia question is basically, what is the coral that we've been using in our little um, lower thirds overlay? So if you know this, tweet the answer to us. Um, on Twitter, obviously, at Title Gardens, and use hashtag TG Live. And the first person to correctly answer will get um, some Coral RX. I'm just taking a peek here at Twitter. And once somebody gets it right, um, Ben will let me know, and I'll uh, I'll announce it. So, let's carry on then. Number twenty-one is a Midnight Princess Favides. Yeah, after I get done, got done saying how difficult it is to tell the difference between Favia and Favides, I've so far shown you one Favia and one Favides. So, um, like, how did I come up with those particular designations? I kind of made it up. So, there's certain ones that look like what I've seen that other people call Favia and other people call Favides, and I just kind of go with it. But in reality, it may or may not be. Um, but I've we just kind of just by convention, just got used to calling what looks like that a Favides. Okay. So let me check Twitter again, see if anybody's got it so far. So let's see. I need to do a couple announcements real fast. So, um... While we wait, let's see. 
a few days ago, we actually had um, Google finally publish a 360 walkthrough of the greenhouse. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, on Google Maps, there's like a street view. Well, they're rolling out this thing where you can actually get an internal view of businesses um, that wanted to kind of show off their interiors. And so we actually signed up for that. You need to get um, a Google approved photographer to come in and do some 360 degree panoramics. But um, we did that. And so now both on obviously on, on Google, Google Maps and whatnot, and we've also embedded it on our website. You can take a walkthrough, like a virtual walkthrough of the greenhouse and just take a look around, see where all the tanks are and things like that. It's kind of a neat little a little new feature that we have going on. All right, so what number of coral are we on again? 21. All right, moving on. Um, number 22 is a blue moon chalice. And this guy is $5. Next up is our killer tomato zoas, and they are 25, I believe. Yep, 25. Okay, so Ben just said that somebody's got Twitter. Is that the correct answer, Ben? So far, I'm actually not seeing the correct answer. So yeah, contest is still going on. Next guy here is the Fire and Isolas. And these guys are, I think, $5 practically giving these away. So Fire Nice Zoas are one of those things that has, um, it kind of describes a million different Zoas. I mean, if you went online right now to Google Images and just typed in Fire Nice Zoas, you're probably gonna see the first 10 are all different. So um, we've gone through a whole bunch here that have looked different from one another that we've all kind of labeled Fire Nice. So unfortunately, um, horseshoes and hand grenades as far as this little designation goes. So I should probably go over the rules again um, for the late arrivals that didn't catch the very, very first part of the stream. Um, the time now is 425 Eastern Standard on January 10th. And if you're watching this stream right this minute and it's not that time, you are currently watching the rebroadcast. Um, Google, or I should say YouTube, um, once we're actually all done and wrapped up on the live stream, they publish it directly to the Tidal Gardens YouTube channel. So you can revisit this um, much later after the fact. So how this works is um, it's the, the live show is actually broadcasted in real time. However, we recommend that you kind of open up two browsers, one that has Tidal Gardens open where you can see the live sale category and also have YouTube open where you can uh, use the chat to, to talk with us directly. So if you do plan on purchasing corals in the live sale, 
um, it is all first come first serve. In that category, you can see uh, the item numbers and their prices, but you kind of have to pay attention to the stream itself to see what those corals are. It's a bit of a mystery. So you, it's first come first serve, like I mentioned. You can purchase the corals by actually checking out. It's not um, sufficient just to put it into your shopping cart and wait. You actually have to completely check out with it. Um, and the shipping, how this works, is that it's a $39.99 flat rate, but it's free for orders over $250. So as you're purchasing corals, you, I expect a lot of people will be purchasing them one at a time. Um, there's a shipping option specifically for live sales that um, zeroes out the shipping cost, and then you can add in the $39.99 shipping module at the very, very end once you're done purchasing. So in a nutshell, that's kind of how it works. All right, I lost my place. What number am I on? 25. Okay. So the next coral is very, very flat because he fell over. Actually, Matthew, can you just like reach in there and just turn him in such a way where we can kind of like see his face? Yeah, that'll work. Nice. Live show, people. Uh, that guy was, like I said, the mean green chalice and all that work, it's a dollar. <laughs> so, all right. Moving along, number 26 is a pink bird's nest. Most of the time when it comes to bird's nests, we recommend keeping them in slightly lower, more subdued lighting. However, when it comes to the pinks, they tend to only get that really vibrant pink coloration under very, very intense light. So right now, they're actually in that kind of that muted color phase because it's winter time right now. Um, however, I think that if you were, you were to put this guy under some stronger like LEDs or stronger metal halides, you would get that bright, bright fluorescent pink. Speaking of winter, I don't know what the temperature is outside where you are, but it is freakishly bone chilling cold here. It's about minus two degrees here, and I'm under the weather as a result. So I'm a little congested, a little lower energy than I usually am, but hmm, such is life, I guess. But um, yeah, so I should mention that we do not ship when it is this cold. Um, we're gonna probably have to work out some shipping details um, like early next week as to what days we can realistically send corals out. Because even though we send corals in um, a styrofoam cooler with a heat pack, there's still physics involved. And there's no way that you're going to be able to keep a box, a small box, into the 70s when it is minus 5 out. There's just literally no way to do that. So hopefully um, uh, when you guys are purchasing, keep it in mind that we're going to have to work out shipping details. Unless you're local and you can come pick it up. Moving on. Next coral here is another marbled fa favites. Like I said, um, I think it's a favites. And let's see if we've got a Twitter winner yet. All right, Sean Fuller gets the coral RX. He correctly guessed that that is a golden leptoceris. Next up, these are kind of cool. 
This is a, a Gorgonian that we recently got. We typically don't do a lot with Gorgonians because, um, well, number one, I don't see them that often. Um, number two, when we do see them, we're often uh, picking up the Caribbean ones that tend to be a lot easier because they're photosynthetic. And we almost never pick up the Pacific ones um, because being non-photosynthetic, they kind of have a specialized diet, a very, very small zooplankton, small phytoplankton, and most systems aren't well, I guess, suited to... Uh, to provide their filter feeding requirements. But we did end up with these guys. And uh, you're, you're gonna see more of these, so um, if you like this particular one, go ahead and hop on it. But we're gonna be offering like uh, a few more of these as the show goes on. But uh, it's a very, very bright blue polyp. And so far these things have just done extremely well for us. I don't know how well they're gonna do long term for us here because we don't actively feed a lot of Fido. But if you're, if you're into um, kind of a non-photosynthetic system already and are looking for, um, you know, like a really, really nice show-type Gorgonian, I can barely talk, Gorgonian, this is a really good candidate. I mean, it's, it's not too often that you see really awesome blue polyped anything, but this is top of that list. Next up... We've got a plating Montipora. I think we have like three different types of plating Montipora. Um, we kind of have like a, a dusky purple one, a dusky green one, and a bright orange one. So you're looking at the bright orange one right here. Next up, our Forest Fire Digi. One of the nicer branching Montipora out there. That brings us to a zoa colony that we've got. This guy's our eagle eye. I haven't been listing off prices verbally. Um, I'm sure you can read the overlays yourself. Uh, this guy, these guys are twenty dollars. And I've got to move my slider again, so I'm going to cap the screen one sec. This guy here is our Duncan. It's a teal Duncan, a single polyp. It's ten dollars. I always lose my place for some reason. I always have to refer back to my list. Next guy up is the Blueberry Shortcake Acropora for $20. These guys have done really well for us. When they first came in, they were like a, a totally haunting blue color. And now they're more of um, of a deeper blue. They're like 
pretty much any type of acro, they're going to change color pretty substantially. But again, it's uh, like blue is one of the harder colors to find. Yeah, and this uh, particular frag is about an inch and a half. Next up, we have a green platygyra. And I'm also sorry, losing track a little bit. We're only intermittently doing the, the color change, but hopefully you get the picture. Next up here is just a, a little neon green acro. This guy's tiny. It's probably only about like a half inch or so. Five dollars. Okay, I'm capping once again because I have to move to another tank. One sec. This guy is our emerald scoli. I know some people were out there were looking for some scolies. How much is this guy? He is only $65. So there you go. Okay, next up is another scroll coral. This one's slightly larger than the previous one, I think. Number 38 now, the Dreamweaver Chalice is $25. As far as chalices that grow well here, this is probably my all-time favorite. We have several really nice ones, like really, really, really crazy nice ones, but uh, they don't grow nearly as well as this guy does. We've had this one for years and years. Okay, next up is number 39, the Laguna Paleothoas. And kind of like the whole thing with Favia and Favites, um, it's really challenging to figure out what is a Zoa and what is a Pali sometimes. Um, there's a huge, I guess, uh, variation amongst zoanthids where you end up with some that have a lot of paleothoa like characteristics and this is one of those types of tweeners that a lot of people out there would call a paleothoa a lot of people out there would just say that's just a really big zoanthid um, I'm kind of on the fence on that and I think that chances are you've, if you've heard me describe something that looks like this about half the time I might have called it a zoa and the other half I might have called it a paleothella. So, who knows? Not me. Next up
got a nice purple discosoma and he is only ten dollars Okay, so that uh, takes care of the first 40 corals in today's live sale. Um, it's time for another trivia question. So trivia question number two is, what is the total system volume of Tidal Gardens here? So once again, if you tweet the answer to us, uh, do so at Tidal Gardens, hashtag TG Live. And I will give you a hint, it is probably not actually written correctly on our website. It might be. But certainly not in the greenhouse page. I already checked, so I can save you that little step right there. The greenhouse page is like really deceptive because um, it's written uh, chronologically. So what that means is it was... Uh, the stuff that's that uh, is marked like 2002, for example, is what I was literally thinking in 2002, right or wrong. So, um, you know, back then we were about 2,000 gallons, and we've grown substantially, or 3,000, and we've grown substantially since. Um, but it's kind of fun to read through that page occasionally, because I make a lot of um, big assumptions, because not a lot of people do coral aquaculture in a greenhouse. There's really not a lot of references to, to find out information and what to expect and how to overcome certain things. So a lot of it is you just have to make assumptions. And it's fun to go back and read which assumptions really worked out and which ones were incredibly, terribly wrong. So all of that is kind of uh, just written chronologically. And so finally, when you get to the very end, is more or less present day. And at some point, Ben will let me know once somebody gets that answer right. But in the meantime, let's move on to number 41. That was a purple discosoma. This is a smaller blue discosoma. Also $10. I'm going to go check the Twitters real fast. I am not seeing the correct answer yet. All right. So anyway, uh, next guy up, number 42, is a Harlequin Gamiapora. So of all the corals in this hobby, Ganyapora are probably in the top three as far as having a bad reputation for survival. And a large part of that is um, that there's many Indonesian varieties that were imported for the past 30 years that have chronically not done well. And it's mainly these large, um, I guess large stocked green ones, um, Ganyapora stokesi mostly. And they just last for about three to six months and then just collapse. There are other varieties though. There's about 20 other species of Ganyapora and several of them do super well. Now, this is one example of one that does super well. We have probably fragged this Harlequin Ganyapora no more or no less than 50 times I would say. There's frags of this thing all over the place and you can probably tell that um, it's very hard to even see a frag plug underneath all that. But yeah, somewhere in there is where we glued it to a, a frag plug. Okay, moving on, number 43 is another Acropora tenius. I apologize in advance if this is not what we say it is as far as like the species of Acropora. I'm not a super acro expert, but this is a, a fairly close representation of what I've seen of uh, the, the Tenius acros. So hopefully I am getting this one right. This guy is $15 and is about, it's about three quarters of an inch to almost an inch, but it has uh, three main stalks that are good size.
Next up is our neon green Nephthia for 25. And it's a very tall coral. This guy is at least three inches. So we'll just give it a quick scan here. But you can see very large stock. Does even fit in the frame. Oops. Okay, I'm going to check the Twitters again. Nope, not yet. So far we had, we've had a guess of 10,000 10, gallons and 7,500 gallons. Nope, not quite. Somewhat close, but not quite. I wish I was 10,000 gallons. Okay, next up. Got our red Blastomusa Merletti. These guys are super fast growing. They like low light and can be fed pretty generously. Because they've never gotten into uh, to Blastomusa before, this is probably a good starting point. Next up here we have um, a blue ridge coral. This is also huge. So starting off, you can just see at the base that the entire base is completely encrusted all the way to the bottom. And this guy comes all the way up to here. It's three, four inches or so. And they're called the blue ridge because even though they have a mostly purple look, that edge, that growth edge, kind of glows a bright blue under actinic. It's kind of interesting. Also, if you provide like a lot of heavy flow, um, we moved this guy uh, like yesterday, so once they kind of get agitated, they, they close up like this. But you can see those little, little dots, and those are where its polyps extend from. The whole thing will look like a hairy, bushy, um, uh, I guess the closest thing you can think of is like an encrusting gorgonian, if you're familiar with what that looks like. But it actually takes on a very hairy appearance if it's provided some nice flow and is left alone. Next up is, let's see, number 47. These guys are the Leonardo Zoas. Actually, can you move this entire rack a little bit forward? Yeah, it's kind of... Yeah. And of course, the zoanthids close once you make any motion towards them. So hopefully you got a good little glimpse of it once it was open. Next is the Teal Discosoma. It's ten dollars. It's always interesting to to read the chat. It's like it's so distracting and like trying to do like both the live show and do you know kind of choral descriptions and whatnot, and also read the chat. I need to get like a heads-up display like Google Glass or something like that that just has it streaming like right where I'm looking. Yeah, so so far nobody's got the Twitter question right. Uh, the Twitter question again um, was what is the total volume in gallons that Tidal Gardens has here in reef aquariums? Okay. 
Okay. Next up, we have a metallic green acro. And this guy's also giant. So I'll start at the base. And we'll just scale it up. In total, I would say it's a good no, almost three and a half inches at least, but it's got a lot of different branching going on. It's deep green skin with almost white polyps. And if you remember what the base looked like, it's pretty much grown through. Show you that again. Yeah, tons of growth on this guy. And that brings us to number 50. And if you didn't already know, it's a pink bird's nest. Okay. So if you didn't already know how to go about purchasing the corals that you're seeing here, you can go to titlegardens.com and on that, on that front page, there should be a link kind of on the left where uh, there's a blinking red dot for live sale. Once you go there, you can see um, all of these corals, but only the, the item number and the price. So you kind of have to pay attention to the broadcast itself to see what the corals actually are. And you can put any of those items into the shopping cart and check out. And that is actually the only way to, to finalize the purchase for any of these guys. Uh, it, it doesn't really save it if you just put it into your shopping cart. You actually have to check out every single time. The best way that I've kind of um, you know, figured out how to do these live sales from the spectator end is to have YouTube open separately and have Tidal Gardens open separately on different win on different um, on Windows or browser windows. Um, because on the YouTube end, if you're watching this uh, live, you can actually interact with us. There's plenty of chat going on right now, in fact. Um, and on the Tidal Garden side, you can make purchases if you like. So I should probably state that um, it is currently 4.54 p.m. on January 10th, so um, that is the, the current live stream, and if you're, if you're watching and it's not 4.54, um, you're probably watching the rebroadcast, and unfortunately the chat is probably closed when you're watching it. Okay, so I need to move the camera a little bit, so we're going to cap and be right back. Need to frame up this next coral here. This is our Tabastria. So once again, if you missed the, the description of the first Tabastria that, that we showed, um, this is a non-photosynthetic coral. So it kind of has to be fed multiple times a day for, for peak health. You can kind of see where it's um, already starting to come out just a little bit. It's not super late here, but it's already getting dark, and these guys typically open up um, fully at night. 
So um, I always say that if you have like a, a security camera that you can like look at at night, like that has night vision, kind of like a drop cam, and just stuck it to the side of your tank. Um, if you were to look at this at around midnight or so, um, it would be completely open and take up three times the space. And unfortunately, that's also the best time to feed it. So to kind of get around that, if you feed it at regular times during the day, they learn that behavior, and so you'll have a coral that's pretty much open 24-7. Next guy up is a green-centered Blastomusa welsi. We like to, to, to get individual polyps of Blastomusa welsi growing because the way that they grow, kind of differently than a Merletti, is that it grows new heads at the very perimeter of its base. So a single head like this will, will quickly grow to like eight because the entire perimeter starts to grow little heads. And that's kind of how you end up with like a, a ball of Blastomusa welsi. Number 53 is our Insane Carnival Chalice, I believe. Is that right? It is. Okay, and I think we finally got a winner on Twitter. So Sarah Bauman correctly guessed that Tidal Gardens has 5,000 gallons of reef aquarium systems. So congratulations, you get some Coral Rx. For any of you that didn't already know what Coral Rx is, it's a, a pest control dip that we use pretty extensively here um, even like between systems and things like that when we're trying to move corals in and out we always try to give it a, a dip in this in this pest control dip just to knock off any kind of like little hitchhikers that might have been in there um, it doesn't eliminate absolutely everything but my philosophy when it comes to prevention of any kind of pests or invasive anything is that if the treatment is able to stop just one infestation it makes the whole process worth it because once you get something like really, really awful, for example, like a Montipora eating nudibranch or something, it's, it's completely demoralizing. It's like the worst thing ever. So any little bit tends to help. So we're pretty religious about trying to dip in, in Coral RX all the time. Like we pretty much use it every day. Moving on, the next coral that we've got is an all eulophilia. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but it's a type of a maze brain. Next up is an awesome, gorgeous pink Ganyapora. So once again, Ganyapora have a really bad reputation in this hobby, but occasionally you do run into a, a select few that do pretty well. And so far, um, I wouldn't say that this one does quite as well as the Harlequin in our experience, but they have done pretty well. Now, I have to say that some of the ones that we've sold in the past are doing much better in other people's aquariums. So for example, I went to um, one of my friend's uh, homes, Will, and you can probably see his, his tank um, in a video that we did close to a month ago. Uh, it's, one of, it's one of the more recent videos, I guess. But in there, you can see a giant ball of this pink and red Ganyapora that he purchased from us. And it is easily 
five times the size that it was here. It has, and the, the polyp extension is out of this world. I mean, that also, in addition to the full colony size, is also about five times the extension. So of course I got interested, like how did you go about you know, caring for this coral to get it to respond like that? And there weren't a lot of differences between his system and mine, but the one thing that stuck out was carbon dosing. So for a little while there, we were experimenting with carbon dosing. Um, I had a bottle of vodka laying around, and one of the ways to introduce the carbon needed is, uh, when we say carbon dosing, you're essentially trying to add some sort of like ethanol. So you can um, you can do use like um, like vinegar. You can use vodka. There's all different types of carbon sources, and they all kind of behave differently. He was using a Red Sea product, which is kind of like a, a premium thing, but I happen to have vodka laying around that I don't really drink a whole lot of. So we started to dose between three to five mLs and started and slowly ramped it up from there. And um, the idea, for me anyway, wasn't so much to reduce nitrates and phosphates, which is what most people are trying to do with carbon dosing. What we were trying to do was to promote the growth of this algae or not algae, I'm sorry, but bacteria. And it turns out that corals consume a lot of bacteria as a main staple in their diet. And that might be the reason why some of the more tricky corals are not surviving, is because they're not getting that bacterial load that they're normally accustomed to in the wild. Something that we played with, and unfortunately it didn't quite work out for us. We noticed in the one tank that we were, um, we were doing it in, uh, we started to get some some slow tissue necrosis on our SPS or STN for those of you familiar with that and um, we couldn't really figure out why and then I looked it up that sure enough STN and carbon dosing is kind of a thing so we stopped temporarily we might try to pick it back up later when we know some more about it but right now not too comfy with the whole process um, but it's something that we're still paying attention to. I know a lot of folks out there um, had some major questions about carbon dosing, and I, I'm still trying to do some some background work to to eventually do like a, a fully fleshed out video on the on the subject. But right now, I just don't quite know as much as um, I would like. I guess. Moving on, uh, we're going to go to number six, which is an. Acropora millipora. This little guy is only about a half inch. And he's only $10. Pretty good price. I just had a random thought. One of my, um, one of my friends, uh, he's actually a, an importer. He saw the live stream and he was kind of joking. It's like it's it's it reminded him of QVC. It's like um it's like an online QVC for for corals. Okay, next up, we've got a sympodium. Blue and green sympodium, it's 15. Number 58 is a neon green marilina. Fifty nine is a blue eyed lithophyllum. Chalices come from a lot of different genera of corals. So you might find one from a particular genus like 
like oxypora or echinopora. Well, lithophyllin is, is another um, one of the, the genera that um, people often describe as a chalice coral. Next up, number 60, is a little frag of our yellow acro. Okay, so we've gone through the first 60 corals already. That brings us to our last trivia question of the day. So the question is, what is the saltiest body of water in the world? So if you know it, tweet the answer to us at Tidal Gardens, hashtag TG Live, and you'll get the last of our uh, Coral Rx that we're giving away today. Speaking of carbon dosing, when we were doing it, um, we were literally putting in five to seven mLs towards the end, and you could absolutely smell it throughout the greenhouse. Now to put into perspective what five to seven mLs looks like, it's a little bit more than what you would use to do your, like a Salifert test kit, that little syringe that comes with it. We were using that syringe, and that entire syringe is like five mLs. So that much vodka in a thousand gallons, and you could smell it. It was like the weirdest process ever. Like it was just so strange. It had this almost like this fermented smell that would come out from the from the tank, just from that little little bit. What are we looking at here? This is a green cephastria. This is coral number sixty one. It's ten dollars. Next up, is a pink astriopora. So, so far, if you've been paying attention, we haven't actually had any acans yet. So this is our first and probably our only for today. This is a rainbow echinata. And it sounds like we just had the trivia winner on Twitter. So let's see who got it. Okay, so Puffer Mike 64 got that correct. It is, believe it or not, it's called Don Juan Pond. And Don Juan Pond, D-O-N-J-U-A-N, is, um, is actually like a lake in Antarctica. And it has like 40% salinity. Like much more than what's in the Dead Sea, which a lot of, a lot of people out there were guessing Dead Sea. Yeah, but yeah, there's this, there's this little place in Antarctica with the most saline body of water, believe it or not. Okay. So next we have sky blue hydnophora. And I'm moving the camera again. One sec. We've got one of our Duncans here. A 
Neon, Neon Green Duncan is $20. Next up, number 66 is a Golden Leptosiris. So this is the coral in its overlay, in the overlay that we're using today. So somebody was asking um, about a previous coral uh, about the Hydnophora, whether it's a branching or encrusting, and that one starts as a branching, or I'm sorry, it, it starts to encrust, and from that encrusted base, it starts to grow from there. And also on, on chat here, Peltwork is asking, so Tidal Gardens does not do any type of carbon dosing? Currently, no. We did about two weeks ago, but not right now. All right, moving on. Got a pink Pasolipora. Only a dollar. Next up, number sixty-eight. This is our rainbow Montipora. Yeah, so the Rainbow Monty is fifteen dollars. Number sixty-nine is a Cobalt Favites, and I think this one's only five five dollars. Next up is our Golden Chalice. We'll do the color thing, just to see if uh, this one shows off anything. Chalices in particular can have really unpredictable fluorescence, so um, it's, it's, it's always neat to, to see it under like a pure actinic or something like that, to see what that looks like. So that's our golden chalice colony. colony. It's basically one eye. Next up, item number 71, is an Elegance. So this guy's kind of big. Um, best way to show it off, I think what I can do is get really creative with either scaling this whole thing or moving my slider. I'll move my slider, we'll see how this works. It didn't. <laughs> nope, that didn't work at all. Sorry, that was drunk cam. Okay, attempt number two. much better. So this elegance is how much now? 50. Usually we sell these guys for about 75 on our website so it's a pretty decent savings if you're looking to get into some elegances. This guy fully across four, almost five inches I would say. Mm. 
next is a colony of parietes. So this in total is, oh, I don't know, it's a good, I don't know, three, four inches across and another three to four inches tall. Show you a little bit more of its base here. It's a pretty cool yellow showpiece SPS if you're if you're looking for something like that. Next up it's our neon green trachea. He's fifty dollars. So Peltwork is also asking, has TG ever had a case of elegance syndrome? No. Uh, so elegance is, I'll just show you the elegance again while I'm talking about it. But the elegance is, um, the issue with them is that the, a lot of the ones that were harvested out of Indonesia started to get this very, very mysterious disease. And that disease caused like, kind of like this jelly-like um, bacterial issue and they would just collapse after a few months. And so, they're actually, they, so they were, for a long time, a very, very fragile coral as a result. But all of ours come from Australia, and I've never purchased um, an, an Indonesian one in like the last close to 15 years, I would guess. Um, so the ones that we have are actually very, very, very robust now. Okay. One last camera move. This is our golden eye chalice. It's a pretty cool red with yellow eyes. It's item number 74. And lastly, last coral of the day, is our hybrid hammer. I always kind of liked these euphilia because if you look closely at its tips, the uh, you can almost see like this staticky speckle of green and purple. And so this single head is $20. So actually, we made pretty good time. That was about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Um, we will be back here tomorrow to finish up the second half of the live show. So hopefully you can tune in for that. It'll, again, be uh, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, so yeah. I don't think that there's anything else to announce. Um, oh, there's one last thing. So uh, it turns out that the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, uh, contacted me about a, three weeks ago, and they wanted to, to use some of my footage that was on YouTube for um, one of their upcoming specials. And the name of the, of the show, I think, was like the world's weirdest events or something like that, and I have no idea what they would be um, using my footage for. But that's, I guess, is a thing, and so once I know a little bit more about that, um, I'll point you guys towards uh, whatever show is uh, is going to have my footage that's being produced by the BBC. It's a cool uh, it's a cool thing for them to reach out. I think, and it's it's always nice to say to be able to say that um, you do good enough work that you know, like a large company like that would be interested. But yeah, world's weirdest or nature's weirdest events, something like that. Anyway, I'll let you guys know. So so long. That pretty much does it for tonight. Um, and hopefully you guys will be back here bright and early at 4 p.m. See you guys.